Members, we have a quorum. This is the appointed time, so may I call to order this meeting? Item 1 on the agenda, confirmation of minutes of meeting, which is a meeting held on the 19th of February. The minutes have been circulated to members. The Secretariat has not received any proposed amendments from members. So may I take it that the minutes are confirmed? All right, thank you. Item 2 on the agenda. Information papers issued since the last meeting. Uh, since the last meeting, the administration has altogether issued three information papers. The first one is information on the financial position of the Applied Research Fund for the period of the 1st of June to the 31st of August 2012. LC paper number CB bracket 1757 slash 1213 bracket 01. The second paper, an information paper on the 18th working meeting of the Hong Kong Guangdong Cooperation Joint Conference, LC paper number CB bracket 1829 slash 1213 bracket 01. The third one, the administration's paper on United Nations sanctions, Democratic People's Republic of Korea, Amendment Regulation 2013. LC paper number CB bracket 1848-121301. Third item on the agenda. Date of the next meeting and items for discussion. Yes. Yes, Ms. Emily Lau. About this uh, paper number 829, have you read it out about Hong Kong Guangdong Corporation Joint Conference? Yes, I've read it out. Then will we discuss this co joint conference because especially for uh, th uh, bo those uh, among us who cannot go back to the mainland, we should know more about it. You are familiar with it. Well, but you haven't put it on the agenda, so what will happen? So maybe I will remind uh, PS to uh, brief us on the paper if we have time. Date of the next meeting will be the 21st of May 2013, Tuesday, 2.30 p.m. For discussing the two items, the first one is report on the progress of implementation of the dedicated fund on branding, upgrading and domestic sales. The second one is fostering the development of intellectual property trading in Hong Kong. So these two items will be discussed at the meeting on the 21st of May. Any suggestions from members? Is it all right that we discuss these two items next time? All right, thank you. Third item on the agenda. Promotion of innovation and technology. Let's invite the administration in. May I welcome representatives from the administration for attending this uh, meeting to discuss the item. Uh, we have Ms. Janet Wong, Commissioner for Innovation and Technology, and uh, Mr. Johan Wong, um, Deputy Commissioner for Innovation and Technology. So, Commissioner, would you like to walk us through the paper and then the floor will be open for questions from members? All right. Members, I'd like to thank members' uh, staunch support for information, uh, innovation and technology. And uh, the uh, our members have urged uh, that more importance be attached to R&D uh, so that the uh, GDP, its proportion on GDP will increase and the uh, chief executive has also undertaken to increase the R&D in the public sector. And there are three initiatives that we would like to roll out. The first one is that for universities, we would like to apply for funding 
for transferring technology uh, or knowledge from academia to society. We propose that uh, funding up to a ceiling of $4 million each year be allocated for three years uh, before a review is conducted. The second initiative is about PK, uh, PSKL. And members may know that um, there are uh, around 260 state key laboratories on the mainland, and uh, some of our laboratories are also partners. Uh, we have 12 um, partner state key laboratories in Hong Kong, PSKL, and the first round of uh, funding allocation had already started and uh, $10 million in five years, starting from 2011-12. And for uh, SKLs on the mainland, the funding uh, was uh, less. Uh, and our proposal this time is to increase the funding to $5 million. And uh, we have started the program for two years already, and in the coming three years, the amount will increase from $2 million to $5 million each year, so that they can further develop uh, our, uh, the latest technology. The last initiative is about CNERC, and that is the Hong Kong branch of CNERC, and uh, basically the model is uh, quite similar to PSKLs, but as stated in its name, it's more uh, inclined to support on um, technology uh, research. And we feel that applied technology is very uh, useful, so we have rolled out a pilot point, a uh, pilot uh, center, and that is we have a, uh, a, a, an institute on integrated circuit system, and we're going to widen the scope to include our own R&D center. As the pilot program has been completed, we hope that each of this CNERC will be given funding support of $5 million each year for three years. And during the three-year period, uh, I mean, upon inspiry of the three-year period in 2015, a review will be conducted and we will consult members by that. All right, thank you, Commissioner. Questions from members, please. The first one, Dr. Elizabeth Quart. Thank you, Chairman. I'm not a member of this panel, but thank you for allowing me to ask questions here. On this topic of promotion of innovation technology, I am in all support. In particular, more support should be given to R&D, and universities in Hong Kong should also take part in state programs, and uh, it's worthwhile of our support. I'd like to know more about the following. Now, the administration in relation to the um, R&D cash rebate scheme, the administration's requirement is uh, that um, there should be partnership with uh, public research institutions be, or, or partnership projects or it's projects under ITF before you can get the funding from the scheme. So will there be duplication of support? And is it a good thing? Uh, should, shouldn't more companies be allowed to take part under the scheme, Commissioner? Thank you, Dr. Quart. You asked about the R&D cash rebate scheme. Under the scheme, as long as a company takes part in any innovation technology project under the Innovation and Technology Fund, it will receive cash rebate. On the other hand, uh, if a company is not under the ITF, but then it uh, has carried out a partnership project, for example, if it is a designated local public research institution, like a university, it can also receive a cash rebate. So my question is, it must be a partner, and it must have got funding from the ITF 
before it's eligible for R&D cash rebate. So my question is whether this will mean a duplication of um, funding support, and couldn't you widen the scope to cover more companies? Actually, there are these are two different matters. The funding from ITF is for R&D, and in order to encourage more companies to take part in R&D, we offer cash rebate under the R&D cash rebate scheme. I don't think there is a, uh, there is any duplication here. Are you asking for more? Are uh, you asking that there should be partnership um, besides universities? My question is, let's say if I'm a company, uh, I want to pick part in this cash rebate scheme, but then if I am not doing any project under the ITF, or if I'm not doing any partnership projects, that is to say, my partner has nothing to do with the uh, funding support that you mentioned here. Does it mean that I won't be eligible for R&D cash rebate scheme? For this scheme, any time a company applies for a project involving innovation and technology, it uh, will be eligible. So it must be a participant of the ITC. Is, is that the case? Either projects under the Innovation Technology Fund or partnership projects, that is partnering with the six universities and the R&D centers and the Productivity Council, VTC, and the um, Applied Institute of Biotechnology. These are designated local public research institutions. So it's either ITF or local public research institutions. Your question is whether in-house research can be conducted by individual companies. In fact, under the OTF, there is uh, also an R&D fund for SMEs, which supports in-house research by private companies. There is no need for these companies to partner with any local research institutions, and since it it is also under a project under ITF is eligible for the scheme. Dr. Quad, I think your your time is up. Yes, I'll observe the time limit. Five minutes each. Next, Mr. Wang Ting Kuang. Thank you, Chairman. I think the LegCo should also apply for funding to study the Q6. The administration will fund the six local universities on transfer of technology or knowledge. We welcome this initiative. In terms of the scope, I think there is some gray area. I'd like the commissioner to explain to us. Just like in para 11C, professional services for technology transfer will be covered. So. If the company recruits staff from outside with the funding, then is it eligible? Also, um, taking part in uh, techno technology transfer activities, this is also eligible. Let's say if the so-called activity is a, uh, uh, a banquet and I am asked to buy coupons in order to acquaint myself with scientists and explore partnership opportunities, then is it a kind of technology transfer activity? Is it eligible? I'd like to know more whether there will be any requirements, because this is public money. That's Commissioner. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Member, for your question. Now, the funding arrangement uh, is uh, that we have two principles. The first one is that there must be there must not be uh, any double benefit or double subsidy. Sometimes the TTOs of the university might have already got funding support from the uh, UGC, and if it is already receiving 
uh, subsidy or funding support from uh, uh, in the same project from another uh, from the government, let's say, then uh, we uh, will not give any funding to this organization to avoid double subsidy. Secondly, apart from um, allowing flexibility for the university to carry out technology transfer activities, the technology transfer activities must be, um, I mean, the activity must be directed related to technology transfer, and we are discussing with the universities on the detailed funding arrangements. We are considering whether uh, we, it will be done on a reimbursement basis. Chairman, Deputy, Direct, uh, Deputy Commissioner has not answered my question. He talks about principles. I understand the principles. I'm asking about grey areas. I ask a specific question. I'm not talking about double subsidy or double benefit. Of course, this is not allowed. I'm saying, uh, what if it makes use of the funding to recruit uh, staff outside? I understand um, normal activities like a seminar or forum, but what if following the forum there is a banquet or fo following a seminar, uh, there comes a feast? Well, for the, this question, if as well contracting out something, then we will have to look at nature. For example, if you want to um, contract out your legal service, um, maybe you want to find a lawyer to look at um, your intellectual property issues, and there is a need for outsourcing, then you can make use of the fund. But you have to uh, give us the books afterwards so that we can check. Of course, uh, when they do it, we cannot monitor the whole process. But afterwards, the account has to be audited. Um, for example, they have hired a certain lawyer to uh, do something for them, for example, to look at the intellectual property rights, etc. And also for other additional activities as to whether they are related, I think that we have to look at the nature of it, whether it is directly related to knowledge transfer. Now, if it's a banquet, and if you're telling me that a banquet, this banquet is directly related to knowledge transfer, then of course I will be convinced. But if it's a, an occasion for communication, then maybe that's acceptable. So uh, the banquet itself is not acceptable, the sole banquet. Now for the ITC, it also conducts a lot of seminars, and they're very long. Um, they last for the whole day, so there will be lunch break. So uh, for lunch like that, there will be no problem, because that's related to the topic, and also is an entertainment um, within the event. Mr. Mock, before Ms. Emily Lau left the room, she asked me, well, the well, inefficient technology have been promoted in Hong Kong for a long time, so um, what uh, is the progress now? Now we uh, reading this government's paper, and it tells us that uh, more funding will be provided to local public research institutions and universities. Well, that may be a good thing. However, with regard to this issue, I have been talking to researchers, and I asked them what are the uh, problems behind this issue. Actually, for researchers like this, now, if you're talking about simple researchers, of course, um, the companies or enterprises can do these researches themselves. But if it's high-level researchers, then you have to put in a lot of resources. So it seems that they do not have enough funding for each item, and the government is not providing too much help. And for the business sector, For example, industrialists, etc., they may have wrong expectations. They will think that it's actually quite simple. You just do a little thing, and then uh, you will come up with a, a new te technology, and this technology can be transferred um, into the uh, business sector, and then you can go to an exhibition, and people will buy this. Actually, that's not the case. The most difficult part is that after uh, the 
whole research, only one or two percent of it can be commercialized, can be trans and be um, transferred as a technology. And this is not uh, something that researchers are best at. Um, the business sector also may not know what to do with this kind of technology. So a lot of researchers told me that there is also a talent problem in their profession. Now the government is providing these funds for researchers, but can it really solve the problem? It depends on how the money is used. Now, in a university, if it just uh, holds several more uh, matching meetings, that may not uh, achieve the goal. Now, you really need talents. They know a lot about technology transfer, and also marketing studies have to be conducted. And Supplementary technologies may have to be developed so that uh, the te new technology can be commercialized. The academia have told me that even if money is given to them, maybe we, they still do not know what to do. Well, of course, more funding is welcome, but we do not want the money to be wasted. So um, do you have indicators for these researchers? And if there is a shortage of talent, uh, would you rather spend the money on uh, nurturing talents. Well, for the use of funds, actually, we are looking at different aspects. Actually, universities, well, or the UGC, already have a technology transfer uh, department, and many universities also have this kind of offices, but they do not have lawyers. So, um, when these offices talk to the business sector, if they do not have a lawyer, then um, they would have a lot of doubts. For example, if they have a new drug and they want to sign a contract with a pharmaceutical company, then you really need a lawyer. So first of all, for this money, um, you can use it to hire lawyers or other professionals. And also, you can use it for um, training talents. Uh, for example, the existing staff, staff, they can send them to Oxford for um, courses, etc. That's also allowed. Now, I dare, I dare not say that the problem can be resolved immediately. However, we understand that talents are the most important thing. And for some smaller institutions, they only have a few persons. And for universities, they may have a dozen. Well, Chairman, I think more funding should be provided for this kind of projects, but I hope that there can be guidelines and indicators. Uh, we do not want to have too tight a control. That is what um, they are eating what um, in their banquets, etc. But you have to know where the money is spent. Yes, a balance must be struck. You cannot be too rigid, and at the same time, uh, you have to uh, be responsible. So, at the beginning, they have to give us a business plan. Then each year, we will review, review what they have done in the past year. So this is just the beginning. We do not want to be too harsh. So for the first three years, we tend to be more lenient. Each year, they will have to provide a report to us. After three years, we will have a review. So the good performers will be very different from the poor performers at that time. This is only the beginning. So we want to provide them with a good environment. Mr. Lawai Kwok. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I would like to praise the government first. Well, actually, um, in Hong Kong, the level of research is not low. We only have a population of 7 million, yet many of our universities are conducting uh, world-class researchers. Now, from the information paper, we know that there are scientists and researchers in Hong Kong that are participating in National Science and Technology Program's expert database, and they have uh, some major achievements. And also, our laboratories are cooperating with the state 
key laboratories, and some of our studies are regarded as state researchers. Actually, our universities are not just cooperating with um, their kind of past on mainland. They are cooperating with uh, a lot of universities overseas as well. So I would like to praise them. And the government is now uh, providing more funding to them. I really support this initiative. The matter is whether the funding is enough. I have some questions. Now, when it comes to the promotion of innovation and technology, it's not just about supporting the existing projects. The most important thing is um, nurturing a second generation. Now, I have talked to university professors, and they are very worried well, because in Hong Kong, I think people attach much more importance to finance than to technology and science. Well, even though some of our scientists are state-level scientists, yet this is not reported in the news. So the commissioner is here. I would like to ask you uh, what we can do more for promotion and education. Now we have such great achievements. Can we make some documentaries on this scientist? Now we do not need to tell the uh, science sector. They know about this already, but I think our young generation need to know this. Yes, financial services are important, but science and technology are also important. We want to have a diversified society, and it should also be a knowledge-based society. But I think there is a uh, shortage of talents in this area. I think the engineers have funded um, the sh making of a documentary on engineering. So maybe our government can also do something like that. Yes, I actually agree with Mr. Lowe. Well, in fact, we are attaching a lot of importance to INT. Well, you know, every year I'll come here to invite you to come to um, the IT car or the Inno card info. Um, several years ago, uh, we just spent under two hundred thousand dollars on that. Now we have increased um, the budget a lot, and also we touch a lot of importance to electronic mass media. Last week, I was talking to them, and we will be we may be producing two feature programs. Uh, one program is about our scientists. Actually, there are many outstanding scientists in Hong Kong, and that's another possibility. Well, we will look at the importance of technology in different industries. Now, we are cooperating with SCM, and there will be a documentary on logistics. So, Mr. Lowe, we are doing that already. Actually, I had a meeting with uh, the electronic media last week. And in the near future, you will be um, seeing this on TV. Other than publicity, we also want to help young people to find good jobs. Otherwise, after studying science in university, they may um, change to other fields. In fact, in Hong Kong, we really had a good history in this area, and also we have very good prospects. For example, in terms of logistics and uh, infrastructure, I think we need a lot of talents, and I hope that uh, there can be more publicity. Next, Dr. An Chang. Thank you, Chairman. A question for the Commissioner. Now, R&D expenditure accounts for what percentage of our GDP? We have the statistics for 2012 is 0.27%. In fact, you can compare ourselves with other Asian countries. The uh, well, 
We have four Asian uh, dragons uh, for Taiwan. Three point uh, for Korea. Three point seven four um, for Thai for Korea is planning to increase uh, the ratio to GDP ratio to five percent. So you can see that commitment in R and D. So I support that um, the administration should do more on R and D. Now my question is this, Mr. Wong Teng Kwong uh, already asked about it. Now you're proposing to provide funding to local universities uh, for three years with a ceiling of $12 million for three years to support their work in enhancing technology transfer capabilities. In the past, we there were also initiatives to support R&D. So can you tell me something about the realization of um, R&D knowledge and results? Commissioner. Thank you, Dr. Manchang, for your question. Although the percentage is 0 0.27, well, the, the, the 0 0.72, well, the percentage might be small, but it doesn't mean that uh, it has been stagnant. In fact, it has been increased by 5% comparing to that in 2011. But the growth in other sectors like tourism and financial industry sector the uh, has been uh, quite substantial, so the nominator uh, has increased, uh, resulting in um, the apparent drop in R and D. What about uh, realization of innovation technology results? We have five R and D centers, and uh, we hope that. Uh, for these R and D centers, they can commercialize the, re the results, uh, and they can do better than uh, universities. The universities also carry out the uh, realization of results, but R and D uh, places much focus. Uh, R and D centers place much focus on this. Uh, for example, in June, we'll be coming back to brief members on a garment uh, center and the license concerning the technology being sold um, has um, reached uh, almost 9 million and it is partnering with the Hong Kong Polytechnic University and the ASTRI Applied um, Science and Technology Research Institute of Hong Kong every year has also uh, seen a slight increase uh, last year because of the R&D cash rebate scheme. The baseline increased by 20% all of a sudden. So realization of R&D result, well, we ha have made some achievements. Commissioner, I'm sorry to interject uh, in terms of commercialization. Um, we haven't been doing so well, so we should come up with more ideas. I think sometimes the uh, academics might be engaged in R&D projects, but the uh, results might not tailor for market needs. I understand that Chinese University of Hong Kong has also made use of uh, some kind of funding from the government. I don't know whether it comes from the ITC to uh, develop a technology for blood tests that is by conducting blood tests the, um, you can detect a, a possible Down syndrome by um, taking samples from the fluid of um, the placenta. And uh, they are partnering with the uh, U.S. counterparts. But why can't the government take the lead in helping them promote their R&D results? I don't know about that code. 
but it's T21. Chinese University. In the past, uh, embryonic fluid uh, would be taken from pregnant women. But in fact, uh, Professor Lowe developed a technology and he applied for INT as well. In fact, the result uh, has been promoted from the university to the commercial market. So this is something uh, we are proud of and we are discussing actively with the uh, professor on future cooperation. Next, Mr. Martin Lau. Thank you, Chairman. I'm happy to see the commitment and resolve of the administration in promoting R&D. Things have been stagnant, but the administration is now attaching importance to R&D. We will have to wait and see if this will become the driving force. I have some questions. Uh, the first one starting from 2010, the R&D institutions and universities in Hong Kong can apply for um, state key R&D projects fund via the branches on the mainland. So my question for the commissioner is this. About the intellectual property rights arising from the R&D projects, will there be any protection uh, as to who owns the IP rights? Because it has a direct impact on uh, the uh, commercialization of results. And in the whole process, as mentioned by Mr. Charles Mock uh, just now, is a very complex process. And is there any division of works? Uh, is there any special arrangement? Second question. In June 2012, the, uh, we worked with the Southeast University in Nanjing uh, and for the establishment of a Hong Kong branch of the National Application Specific Integrated Circuit System Engineering Research Center. This is the first Hong Kong branch. I don't know whether any other research centers have applied with the mainland to become the Hong Kong branch of a state center. If so, can you tell me the areas of research and on aging population and pollution problems? Uh, the situation is getting worse. And has Astri considered partnering with the mainland authorities in relation to aging population, pollution, etc., in setting up R&D centers uh, or uh, Hong Kong branches of R&D centers. Because on the mainland, we're seeing uh, the development of technology in relation to um, pollution and the environment. Commissioner, I think the member was referring to 973 program. And uh, we have already, um, we already have several projects taking part under the 973. Basically, for, in, for Innovation and Technology Fund, the administration, after giving support, will not uh, own any IP rights. The IP right will fully belong to the institution. So they will have to work it out themselves. So to your knowledge, do you know if there is any uh, systematic arrangement if uh, the research is carried out with the state partner and so on? IP right is a form of right for projects under the 973 program. The funding comes from the Ministry of Science and Technology and the Hong Kong uh, R&D institution will need to work with the mainland counterpart, so they need to work out among themselves uh, how this IP issue uh, should be resolved. Now, for projects under our fund, the ITF, 
things are much simpler. The result of R&D belongs to the local university themselves. Now, for the 973 program mentioned by the member, basically there will be reasonable negotiation with the mainland partner. Uh, I think that it depends on um, the amount of input because usually the input should be proportionate to the R&D result. Anyway, for that program, the funding comes from the mainland. For projects under the ITF, um, we don't own the ITP rights. I'd like to answer Mr. Dell's second question. You asked whether other centers are interested in the CNELC, um, CNELCs, and um, I think this is similar to the uh, State Key Laboratories partnerships that we um, carried out before. We make announcements and look for interested applicants. Now we have uh, 12 rounds already for PSKLs. We are waiting for the announcement of the final round. We don't know what areas they will be engaged in, but I hear during uh, our communications that two local public research institutions have uh, expressed interest, and I have been formally uh, informally to told that universities are also uh, interested in that biotechnology. is a major focus around the world, and um, much of the laboratory's work involves biotechnology. So in the future, I hope uh, that they would uh, come to apply, but uh, for the actual figures, well, we'll need to wait for uh, details to come up before I uh, report to members. Next, Mr. Ma Kuo. Thank you, Chairman. I have two questions. Now, we're building an R&D platform with the mainland research institutes. I'd like to know more about the platform. Is it initiated by the Ministry of Science and Technology, or is the Hong Kong government taking the lead? Or is it simply an interaction between the uh, institutes of both places? So if the government is not taking the lead, does the government have any initiatives in promoting the setting up of this platform for laboratories in uh, local universities? Can they apply for that without partnering with any mainland partners? Now, the other uh, point is about the setting up of Hong Kong branches of CNLC. Uh, does the administration have any measures in uh, encouraging the setting up of Hong Kong branches? And what are the criteria? And do you know of any um, institutes or organizations that meet the criteria in becoming Hong Kong branches of CNLCs? Now, let's say for uh, ASTRI, Hong Kong Applied Science and Technology Research Institute, they, they do liaise with um, other academic institutes uh, in other places. But basically, the liaison with the uh, government is about the ITC, and they dis, uh, discuss and uh, they, they liaise with the uh, ITC. And every year, we visit. Uh, we have a um, duty visit to the mainland, and sometimes they come as well. And during the past few years, we also looked into um, the focus uh, of our work. So for the PSKLs, we actually had um, discussions with them in coming up with this plan. And we do have experts uh, being selected in their program, uh, in their expert database. Now, and we help them in making their submitting their applications to the Ministry of Science and Technology. So uh, the discussion should be carried out 
uh, between uh, governments, but then for um, the academic sector, they can also have partners among themselves. But in fact, they cannot survive without any partner. Um, in fact, several years, we looked into the feasibility of this arrangement because of one country, two systems, and that we are uh, the Hong Kong SAR. The conclusion is that we are a partner state key laboratories, and there must be a partner on the mainland side. We looked into that in the past. Will there be any change? Will that be more conducive to our laboratories? For the time being, I don't think this is likely. And in fact, there is no problem uh, at all. Our partner state key laboratories uh, do exchange with the state key laboratories, and this is a good thing because we can know more about state policies and on application procedures. So we do enjoy advantages by having partners on the mainland. Now, about the uh, partners, do they look for partners themselves, or do they um, form partners, uh, form partnerships on the mainland's recommendations? No, they can choose their own partners. But once they form a partnership, then every year, according to this paper today, the administration will give the funding uh, of $5 million uh, on several matters uh, for several purposes. First, on the nurturing of talents and on forming the partnership so that it can uh, reach a world class standard. So are there any institutes uh, waiting in the queue or in relation to the Hong Kong branch of CNERCs? No, not uh, not a queue for Hong Kong branches of S uh, CNERC at the moment. We only have one uh, Hong Kong branch, and that is the partner with the Southeast University in Nanjing. But all R&D centers have applied. We have discussed with the mainland authorities about that. As for PSKLs, we have completed uh, one round, and the recommendations have been forwarded to the Ministry of uh, Science and Te Technologies. We're waiting for the announcement. And this is done every four or five years. As for the second round, um, can we reduce the um, time limit to three minutes? Ms. Park, I would like to respond to Mr. Law's questions concerning talents. Now, uh, lately, in a news report, it is reported that some IT graduates um, have become uh, construction workers. They are um, iron bar benders instead of uh, IT technicians. So I think you should pay attention to this. And also for the paper, you have talked about the scope of uh, funding, and it has been widened, and I really appreciate that. You have talked about professional service, um, technology transfer, um, training of uh, technology transfer uh, staff, etc. But when it comes to commercial commercialization, we have to pay attention to usability. And it is not mentioned here. I have been to Finland and Japan. So from R and D to product, they have conducted usability studies in every session. Uh, this is very scientific. They have laboratories uh, to do this, and they also have done user behavior researches. Uh, they have got all the data. Now, for example, Japanese users, Hong Kong users, and mainland users may be different, and urban users may be different from uh, rural users. So Hong Kong is actually a good place for doing this because we are not just looking at the Hong Kong market. We can also conduct consumer behavior studies on the mainland, and we do not have this kind of laboratories. So when it comes to commercialization, there is a missing link. For the products we design, are they really suitable for use by the consumers? And does it will it be welcomed by the international market? We do not have talents 
and technology in this area. I hope um, the ITC can look into this so that we can fix this missing link and our competitiveness can be enhanced and more support can be provided to um, the IT sector. Now for ITF actually we have uh, been made a lot of changes. It was set up a dozen years ago and it was just about an R&D report three or four years ago when I took up the position I discovered that there are actually many good reports however these reports um, cannot be implemented so step by step we are doing this. Now first of all uh, we are doing this inside the government and as Ms. Kwok such as now uh, you talked about usability and other things actually we are studying all this that is whether we can further broaden the scope of ITF and there are a lot of terms for example industrial engineering, product engineering, system integration and also service experience Yet for ITF, now it only covers trial, but we want to broaden it further, and this is a very complicated issue. Now, when does the government funding stop, and where does the private sector come in? So um, after um, considering all this, we will come back to members. So, Commissioner, you have heard members' views. Uh, they welcome these new initiatives, but we hope that more can be done uh, for commercialization uh, because sometimes you uh, do a lot of work to come up with products, but there's not much promotion and marketing. So, that is not a thorough support from the government. So, maybe um, the commerce and in a bureau can look at all this. Actually, um, the Polytechnic University has um, put together an electric car. That's very good. But at the end of the day, we have to sell it to the Americans. So if Commerce and Economic Development Bureau can do more liaison work, then maybe these products can be more successful. I hope that a comprehensive service can be provided to the industry. Now, lately we have just talked to the Federation of Industries and we talked a lot about cooperations. So for TID, we will also be cooperating with them very closely. Thank you. So let's move on to agenda item 5. Review report of the Hong Kong Council for Testing and Certification. 2013. Um, so, commissioners, you have to stay here. Yes, and also two of my colleagues will come in. Thank you. I would like to welcome the commissioner again. And also joining her are Mr. John Hong, Secretary General of Hong Kong Council for Testing and Certification, as well as Mr. Wang Wen Hua, Executive Administrator of Innovation Technology Commission. Welcome. Commissioner, so you will take us through the paper again. Yes, Chairman, members. You may know that our uh, department is responsible for the promotion of testing and certification in an industry with huge potential. In 2009, we set up a Hong Kong Council for Testing and Certification and is chaired by Professor Ching Pak Chung, Pro Vice Chancellor of the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And members from the testing and certification industry, business sector, etc., they are also part of this CTC. And um, in 2010, um, ECDs proposed a three-year market-oriented development plan, and this is this blue uh, book. We have already consulted members earlier on. We talked about the uh, development directions. Uh, for example, for land uh, funding, um, etc., we should provide support, and also there are certain trades. 
uh, that are exceptionally potential. So uh, we should be making more effort in those areas. Um, they include Chinese medicines, construction materials, food and jewelry. In the past three years, well, we have been working in accordance with this blueprint. Other than these four traits, we later added environmental protection as well as information and communication technologies. And time flies. Now three years have lapsed. So now the CTC has conducted a comprehensive review, and these two books are the review reports. And earlier on, they have been submitted to members. Well, actually, we are very encouraged. In the past three years, we have. Some good results. Now, for example, when, we come, when it comes to business receipt, in 2009 was 8.6 million, and now it's increased by 25% to 10.8 billion. As for the number of private independent establishments in the industry, it increased from 570 in 2009 to 600 in 2011, an increase of 5.3%. And also for our human resources, it's also increased. Now we have 16 civil servants, and um, these positions have already been created. In the past, um, these were non-civil service positions, but we have long-term commitments. So when we conducted this review, we hired an independent surveying company to um, do the work and the result is actually very encouraging. Uh, all the figures are encouraging. For example, as for the uh, mutual accreditation agree agreements, whether they are, are useful, 90% of the respondents say that they are responsible. And also we have cooperated with ICAC. We come up with an anti-corruption guidelines. And 86% of the respondents say that this is useful. And also, we have been doing a lot of promotional work, and 64% of respondents say this is good. So on the whole, we think that uh, our work results have been quite encouraging. Uh, we hope to improve more. And also, we have reviewed the mode of operation of the CIC, the CTC. We think that we can meet the needs of the industry. It is flexible, and everything's running smoothly. So uh, we hope that um, we can keep this council. In the past two to three years, we have been submitting uh, interim reports to uh, LACHCO, and this time around, we have a comprehensive review report. Mr. Liu Chang Kong. Thank you, Chairman. In 2012, or in the middle of 2012, the Hong Kong CTC added environmental protection and information and communication technologies into its work, and two task forces were set up. So I would like to ask the administration why you think that these two um, industries have huge potential. And now you have six selected traits for testing and certification. So have you considered adding other traits and look at their needs for testing and certification? And I also have another relevant question. Well, for mainland residents, they are very concerned about food safety. So I would like to ask the government, have you formulated uh, the reference policies so that through SEPA you can create more business opportunities for Hong Kong? Thank you, Mr. Liu. Uh, first of all, about the four trades, that is Chinese medicines, jewelry, etc. Uh, why did we come up with these? And then uh, later on, we added two more. Now, in the beginning, we conducted a consultation. We invited uh, members from all industries uh, to talk to us. We asked them if they uh, were interested in uh, testing and certification. 
and we have looked at all the relevant figures. Now, for example, Chinese medicine or jewelry. We have looked at TDC's uh, data and trends. Now, first of all, we will look at the business volume of the um, trace first, and then it was our consensus that these trades uh, would have the brightest futures. As for the remaining two or the latest two, actually earlier on um, we also mentioned them, that is environmental protection and IT. However, we had limited manpower, so we started with four trades only, and then after two years we, also, we included the, these two other trades. Later on, Mr. Uh, John Hong will talk more about IT and environmental protection. As to whether um, war trades will be added in the future, the answer is positive because we will have to look at the needs of the market. We are monitoring the market very closely. As for the original four trades, well, some of them may uh, be taken away. For example, jewelry. Now we are, or uh, some of them. Um, May um, include more areas. For example, um, jewelry originally were just looking at Fei Chui, but um, in the future, diamonds may be added. So there will be new business opportunities. Well, maybe Mr. Hong can say something about food. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Member, for your question. I say something about food first, and then I will say more about environmental protection and information and communication technologies. On food safety, our council attaches importance to it. We understand the public's concern on food quality and food safety. Over the past three years, we have been conducting testing and certification services for food. And in relation to food incidents, for example, um, during the um, nuclear incident in Japan, uh, the general public was concerned about the radiation level in food, and we responded to the sector's request in holding seminars and workshops, so so as to brief sectors, uh, brief the sector on uh, the relevant knowledge and uh, plasticizers. And uh, last year, we also invited experts to brief the sector on uh, the relevant technology. Um, we have ISO 2002 uh, uh, food um, certification, and we also have another standard for SMEs because the SMEs may find it hard to abide by the uh, ISO level. So we worked with uh, the university uh, in Hong Kong on the uh, authentic authentication of um, local food, and uh, the result will be completed this year. And in CP9, we also have the relevant uh, parts, and starting from 2013, in relation to food safety reports from local laboratories, the mainland authorities will accept these reports. Now, so much about food, and I'd like to say something about information and communications technologies. Well, at that time, we selected this trade because uh, some members of the sector reflected to us that uh, they hoped that through testing and certification, the quality and standard of their products could be enhanced. So we do have the sector's support. The panel held meetings to discuss this matter. We have uh, several directions uh, for a way forward. On the one hand, we will raised the standard to ISO 27001 on the testing certification for information and technology. And this is the, the uh, first initiative we want to promote uh, a greater awareness. The other point is that for, uh, after initial studies, we find that in southeastern region, South, Southeast Asian region, the economies are developing uh, and uh, we are discussing with the sector 
on um, business opportunities and what we can do to help the sector enhance their capabilities and raise their awareness. The third area is about cloud computing. This is also an area of concern, and the panel discussed whether, in relation to cloud computing, there should be a certification service in Hong Kong. And the panel has engaged experts in the discussion on whether the services available in the market at the moment can meet the needs of SMEs and whether more business opportunities on the mainland could be explored. On environmental protection, on three areas, the panel also explored with the trade business opportunities in environmental protection. First, on uh, greenhouse gas audits across the world, um, the there's been increased awareness. So this can be a business opportunity, and we will do more on that. The other point is about the energy management system certification. And there is an ISO standard 5001. It was introduced last year. Some major commercial buildings already achieved the standard. Apart from getting the certificate, they said that uh, it could also help the companies in reducing energy consumption. And some overseas buyers would also require um, the company to have this certification. And the third area has to do with green procurement. And uh, some testing and certification services can be provided in this regard. Let's say, for example, if the product claims to be a green product, we can have testing and certification to see if uh, it is uh, authentically a green product. And according to the panel, we can uh, explore further into this area. And this will be our way forward in the coming two or three years. Next, Dr. Loi Kwok. Thank you, Chairman. I need to declare uh, first that I'm also a member of the HKCTC. Uh, the other hat uh, is that I am the deputy chairman of the uh, uh, Hong Kong Quality Assurance uh, Council. I think that the testing and certification industry in Hong Kong in relation to its development is hinged upon uh, international recognition. We cannot work behind closed doors. As said in Chapter 6 of the report, the HKAS has actually taken part in the uh, international uh, or, um, activities. And this is very important. One of the uh, focuses is uh, the accreditation or recognition of our result by the mainland. Under SEPA, for products processed in Hong Kong, the Hong Kong's testing results are accepted by the China Compulsory Certification System, the CCC system. And this is a breakthrough. But may I ask the administration to further explain to us about the acceptance of Hong Kong's testing result by the mainland? Can more be done uh, to promote that further? Because for products processed in Hong Kong, the amount is limited. I think. The laboratory results should also, or laboratory services should also equally be recognized by the mainland. For example, the testing uh, certificates will have equal effect as those issued by the mainland laboratories. Then will this be another breakthrough 
I think this is a good opportunity for the administration to explain to us on this topic. We attach importance. So, since CEPA 7 to CEPA Agreement 9 recently, we have been discussing with uh, the mainland to gradually open up the system to us. Uh, I think I'll defer to PS um, Mr. Hong to say something about this because he's in the front line. Please be brief. As mentioned by Dr. Low, recognition by the mainland is very important. Starting from CEPA 7, we have uh, achieved a breakthrough because in the past, the China Compulsory Certification System, CCC system, did not accept any testing results from outside China. And it was a breakthrough for us. Uh, the results are accepted uh, for the four uh, types of products processed in Hong Kong. And, in, and uh, they need to consider the impact uh, on their own domestic market in relation to testing and certification service. Originally, we had uh, f uh, we were allowed to test four products, but after CEPA 8, we were allowed to test all products, but that it should be those should be processed in Hong Kong. And then under CEPA 9, there's early in, uh, pilot implementation. Uh, for testing of products processed not only in Hong Kong, but also for food products uh, processed in Guangdong. And we hope that through SIPA, the market can be gradually uh, opened up to us. And the framework could be widened uh, to uh, cover Hong Kong so that uh, this will facilitate uh, the, our sector in tapping the mainland market. I don't know if you have... Um, more specific data in this regard so that our sector would understand uh, what has been achieved through opening up of uh, the market. In fact, I do have some statistics with me. CEPA 7 has been introduced for two years and only Laboratories accredited by the HKAS could conduct such tests, and the standard to be used must be that of the mainland. And uh, there are uh, laboratories uh, here in Hong Kong that can conduct testing and certification services. But I understand that these laboratories must partner with state key laboratories. Some are uh, still being negotiated. But I understand that at least four uh, partnership agreements involving three laboratories have been entered into, and the process uh, has been completed. And on the uh, mainland uh, counterparts' website, uh, their names are also listed as acceptable laboratories. Mr. Michael Tian. Sorry, Chairman. I just step in, and here's my turn to speak. First of all, sorry for... Uh, coming in late, I'm also uh, I'm, I'm not a member of this panel. But my question for the administration is uh, that um, I gave a suggestion to the authority as a member uh, of the um, Hong Kong delegate, and it seems that the as the mainland authorities uh, admitted. Uh, their shortcomings. Now, in relation to formula milk, the point is that the, there are 1.3 billion people in the mainland, but they are not confident in their formula milk products. The, however, they are confident in the te testing and certification services in Hong Kong, and I think that there should be a discussion as to how testing and certification services can be applied to mainland products. But I understand that this is difficult. But if this discussion is held between the governments of both places, 
in particular on formula milk products so that some state enterprises, state-owned enterprises that manufactures formula milk products could make use of our testing and certification services. On the formula milk cans, they can put down Hong Kong certifies so that we see fewer parallel goods so that mainlanders can purchase their own formula milk. I want to know whether the administration will start a discussion with the State Council. Mr. Hong, thank you, Chairman, thank you, Member, for your suggestion. I think in the beginning of this year, the implementation of CEPA 9 gave us a very good opportunity to facilitate uh, this area of work. As explained just now, under CEPA 9, testing results from Hong Kong laboratories are accepted by uh, the mainland system. So this will give them confidence in our service, and this is also a, a business opportunity for us. And uh, the, it was implemented only in January this year, and in February, on this topic, we, had, uh, we held a briefing um, when we briefed the sector on this matter. And work uh, has been started. I understand that some laboratories have already uh, inquired about the application procedure. And through contact with the sector, I learned that um, they are negotiating with the mainland uh, units already. I think this is a good start because we have provided a platform and an official arrangement so that testing results from Hong Kong laboratories could be recognized by mainland uh, counterparts. And formula milk, indeed there is uh, a testing certification service for formula milk and it's, and it's included in CEPA 9. Well, Chairman, I think Hong Kong government is quite passive in this. So can it uh, be more active? It can talk to the Minister of Science and Technology or um, other relevant departments on the mainland so that these new measures can be realized. I think the two governments can take the lead and talk to the state enterprises. Um, asking them to make use of our testing services uh, because this can help them sell more of their products on the mainland and they do not have to go overseas for testing. I think this is a very good suggestion, Mr. Tian, but we have to be careful about one thing. Now, if the baby milk formula is tested in Hong Kong, then afterwards you don't know if the mainland companies will do anything to the uh, baby milk formula. And if they tamper with the uh, products, then actually um, it will hurt our reputation. Yes, I agree with you. But if we do the testing, we have to uh, monitor very closely. So it depends on how we monitor the whole process. Now, if our requirements are stringent, maybe we can really be helpful. And also it can help the government when it comes to the ban on um, exporting baby milk formula. Just now, Mr. Michael Tan mentioned this, and actually I support him. Uh, for Hong Kong's testing and certification service, I think it needs to be expanded. Uh, other than meeting the requirements in Hong Kong, we also need to develop more or even expanding overseas. As for Mr. Chen's remarks or suggestion, I think, yes, we can do that, but we have to be careful well, because the products will be put on the shelves um, in the mainland markets, and sometimes there may be fake products. So if we do the testing and certification, 
and if we put a mark there, then maybe after three days we will see a bootleg product with the same mark. So this is dependent on commerce and industry, and maybe we can ask the government to consider this. That is maybe special shops can be set up on the mainland. That there is there can be a special shopping mall which only sells Hong Kong products, and our this our products will bear our uh, test or uh, certification marks, then this will definitely enhance consumers' confidence on the mainland. Chairman, maybe we and I can both work hard and we will continue to talk to the government. Well, we are afraid that the big milk formula manufacturers will object to this, but actually this is our business opportunity. Commissioner, in the paper you say that uh, business receipts have increased and uh, for private independent establishments it's increased from 570 to 6,000. But the industry told me another story. They said that yes, the business receipts has increased, but it's because their company has moved northwards. So have you also taken um, offshore figures into account, and increasing from 570 to 600. Have you also taken into account medical laboratories? Thank you, Chairman. First, about our operation in Hong Kong. Well, for some um, testing companies, maybe um, they have moved to the mainland, but their workload and business in Hong Kong have also increased because Hong Kong is a very competitive. There are 600 uh, laboratories, and I know that the test fees are kept on falling, and their workload has been increasing. Or in the past, maybe most of the work uh, was done for the textile industry, but lately um, um, it's about Chinese medicine, food, um, chemicals, uh, construction materials, etc. Because there are a lot of uh, construction works in Hong Kong, and people are very concerned about the quality of construction materials. So um, these are some changes. So the um, total volume has increased. As for medical laboratories, among these 600 establishments, medical laboratories are included. So this, uh, we get these figures from the um, Hong Kong government statistics, and they <coughs> cover independent establishments, um, of which the main business is testing and certification. So if the major business is doing testing and certification, then um, they would be included. I would like to ask a question about paragraph 24. That's about Chinese medicine. Here you mentioned Hong Kong Chinese material medical standards. Well, actually Chinese medicine is, or Chinese herbs are not grown in Hong Kong, and they are mainly grown on the mainland. So they are plants. So if the climate, uh, the weather changes, maybe um, the quality may change. So if Hong Kong has its own system, would it be different from that of the mainland, or can Hong Kong and China join hands to put to? Together the same standards because in Hong Kong we do not grow our own Chinese medicine. Is it practical for us to have our own standards, Mr. Hong? Well, China has 
its um, own Chinese material medical standards. And in Hong Kong, the Department of Medicine has also put together a set of standards. So it's a supplementary document, and it provides more detailed technical information. It is a very useful supplement. In particular, when it comes to testing and identification methods, there are a lot of details, and Hong Kong laboratories can make reference to these documents. This is a very useful uh, supplement for the testing and certification industry. Uh, the chairman is worried that Hong Kong may have its own standards. Uh, for the Chinese herbal medicine, is grown in farms, and the um, chemical uh, components may change. I have talked to um, the relevant university professors. They have talked about um, the sample standards. Well, of course, um, Chinese herbal medicines are from the mainland. Mainland experts have helped to collect samples on the mainland. And there are different batches of Chinese herbal medicine. So um, they will find out the relevant components and then um, standards will be set. So for different batches, there may be uh, variations. And of course, there are also benchmarks set in the in China's Chinese material medical standards, and also there are there is an international committee uh, monitoring all these, and also um, mainland experts are also sitting on this expert committee because this is not only used by Hong Kong. Um, in overseas countries, Chinese herbal medicine is also used, so they would also make reference to the Hong Kong Chinese material medical standards. So you can rest assured, first this is a supplement, and second, we have considered the variations among different batches. Well, Commissioner, I support this. Oh, if um, sort of this kind of certification can um, be accepted by the mainland, then actually this is a very good business opportunity. Because if a product is tested and certified on the mainland, the mainland consumers may not have confidence in that, and they have more confidence in us. So I hope that this can become a really good uh, business opportunity for us. Well, just now, well, I would like to thank members, first of all. Well, for Mr. Hong's position, actually, is a temporary one. Uh, we didn't create a permanent position at that time because we said that we would have to wait for the this three-year report. But for testing and certification, this is something long-term. So we hope that this temporary position can be turned into a permanent one. And later on, we will be submitting the relevant paper to ESC, and I hope that members can support this. I think most members will support this. Please give us the paper. Yes, we will do that. Well, if they do not appear, then it's, they are just giving up their opportunities. In this paper, you haven't mentioned anything about uh, the position. Well, for that, we will have to prepare a very detailed paper, and that will be a job description. Agenda item number six, support measures for small and medium enterprises. First of all, we would like to welcome the um, Permanent Secretary for Commerce and Economic Development. Mr. Andrew Wong, Mrs. Alice Chung, Top the Secretary for Commerce and Economic Development, and Mr. Brian Low, Deputy Director General of Trade and Industry. 
peers before you speak. Well, I would like to tell you that member, many members have left already. And just now we mentioned, uh, we have uh, read that uh, an information paper has been provided to us. That's about the Hong Kong Guangdong Cooperation Joint Conference. Some members said that they uh, were not too clear about this, and it's not enough by just reading the paper. So can you come to explain to us about this paper? Well, Chairman, each year in about June, we would have this paper. That is about Hong Kong mainland exchange. And each year, we will provide a paper on um, its progress. It's about June or July. That is, um, in the past 12 months, uh, what we have been doing um, on the economic and commercial front. So in June this year, we will provide a paper like this. And together with our colleagues from the Constitutional and Mainland Affairs Bureau, we will come back to report to you in due course. Okay, thank you. So, P.S., you will be walking us through the paper. Chairman, maybe I'll say a few words. Today's paper is about... The special concessionary measures under the SME Finance and Guarantee Scheme operated by the Hong Kong Mortgage Corporation Limited will brief members on the progress and seek members' support on the proposal to increase the cumulative grant ceiling for each SME under the SME Export Marketing Fund. Uh, maybe I'll say something about the special concessionary measures first. Last year, the Hong Kong Mortgage Corporation Limited, HKMC, rolled out special concession concessionary measures. A loan guarantee ratio of 80% is offered at the concessionary guarantee fee rate. And uh, as the end of March 2013, the administration has approved 6,400 applications involving a total loan guarantee amount of over $22 billion. Over 4,600 enterprises benefited from the scheme, and they employed over 120,000 people. The original application period was until the end of February this year, but as the financial secretary announced in this year's budget, that because of the external and economic environment at the moment, the special concessionary measures will be extended for one year up to the end of February 2014. We believe that uh, we, the, the measures will continue to assist enterprises in obtaining loans in the commercial lending market to meet their financing needs. The other initiative in the budget is the SME Export Marketing Fund. The Trade and Industry Department rolled out the SME Export Marketing Fund, EMF, in 2001 to encourage SMEs in promoting their business, including the participation in exhibitions and business missions and placing advertisements on printed trade publications targeting export markets and websites. The maximum amount of grant for each application is 50% of the total approved expenditure subject to a ceiling of $50,000. The cumulative grant ceiling for each SME under the EMF is $150,000. To encourage SMEs to explore business opportunities, uh, we propose to increase the ceiling of uh, for uh, SME and by 50,000 and the additional grant of $50,000 must be used by SMEs to participate in new export promotion activities. That is, in, in, they must participate in export promotion activities other than their activities previously subsidized. We anticipate that around 4,800 SMEs which have exhausted their current cumulative grant ceiling under the EMF 
can benefit from this proposal immediately, with more SMEs exhausting the current cumulative grant ceiling of $150,000, they can also benefit from the additional grants. With, if members support the proposal, we plan to submit it to the Finance Committee in May this year with a view to implementing the proposal in June this year. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, P.S. Mr. Wong Ting Kwong. Thank you, Chairman. Before I speak, I support the Permanent Secretary's suggestion that the proposal should go to the Finance Committee. In the paper, it says, in the budget, the Financial Secretary has announced the extension of the special concessionary measures under the SME Financing Guarantee Scheme be extended by one year, and the DAB supports it, supports it but LegCo once passed a motion urging the administration to discuss with the banking sector in relation to the interest rate under this guarantee scheme. Chairman, you still recall this motion, right? So has the administration considered our suggestion? Has anything been done? Because we have been um, waiting for a long time, and the interest rate it's very low at the moment, but it seems that the banking sector is uh, not um, caring for the SMEs. P.S. Maybe I'll answer Mr. Wong's question. Now, for this SME financing guarantee scheme under the HKMC Limited, it's a market-oriented scheme. I understand the members' concern, but about interest rate, the lending institutions or banks may decide on commercial considerations which uh, or what interest rate to adopt. They may, might consider a basket of factors, including the uh, operation of the uh, borrowing uh, company and uh, the credibility, etc., and the, even the type of enterprise might affect the bank's or lending institution's decision on interest rate. We hope that through a guarantee from the administration, the guarantee fee could be lowered and a loan guarantee ratio of 80% is offered so that more banks will be willing to process or consider the SMEs' applications. The average interest rate under the concessionary measures was about four, slightly over 4 percent, not very high. I understand that in very few cases, say three or four cases, the interest rates were particularly high, but that had to do with the applicant, um, what the SMEs could offer. So at this moment, we do not plan to start any further discussion with the lending institutions. But we'll look at the average uh, lending interest rate and see whether it will be increased substantially because of external market situations. Mr. Wong. Well, Chairman, I think um, what you and I understand to be the interest rate may be different from uh, the PS's understanding. It's not 4 percent. It's uh, P minus uh, so and so. That's the um, interbank rate. In the past, it's, it used to be the premium uh, rate minus uh, so and so. Now it's the interbank loan uh, lending rate. Now you already have a loan guarantee ratio of 80 percent. So in terms of uh, lending risks for banks, 
is being minimized. So I hope the administration could try their best to help SMEs and the council also had a motion debate in this regard. The motion was carried. Uh, we urge the government to do this properly. This is my view. Uh, it's not too late to start doing it if you haven't started. So if you can still um, make up for for it. Now the other point is about this through the through TDC. We already have um, the design gallery shops in uh, some cities on the mainland. This is a good initiative. Has the administration considered that apart from the mainland, there are other markets in Southeast Asian uh, region and uh, even South America or uh, Africa? There are ample business opportunities there. Can you help the sector? You see. The leaders of other countries would bring along um, representatives from the sector in tapping uh, other markets during their visits to other places. So will the administration um, bring along representatives, not only from large corporations but from SMEs as well, on their duty missions to tap um, other markets in Southeast Asian countries and so on and so forth. Yes. Now, interest rate, yes, we will closely monitor the situation. 85% of the cases has an interest rate of 6%, as far as we know. PS for 6% is too high. Yes, we know that. Between 60 to 70 percent of the cases has an interest rate of uh, 5 percent. So it depends on individual cases, the repayment um, capabilities of uh, enterprises will also need to be considered. On tapping new markets, the Trade and Development Council, on a regular basis, does arrange for enterprises to conduct promotion activities in um, uh, those emerging markets. I understand that recently the TDC led a team of um, enterprises to Myanmar to um, explore business opportunities. Every year, during the duty visits, the administration will also bring along the representatives from corporations and uh, chambers of commerce during our duty visits, and we will continue to do that. I understand that uh, this has been done uh, for uh, Southeast Asian countries. P.S. Now for this SME financing guarantee scheme, similar to the scheme uh, rolled out by the administration after SARS, the amount uh, was uh, $100 billion. Well, uh, in the past, uh, that scheme was very well received, but now uh, so far, the uh, total amount only stands at some two, uh, twenty billion dollars. It may have to do with uh, the interest rate, as mentioned by Mr. Wong. Uh, in the previous scheme, the government similarly offered the loan ratio guarantee ratio of eighty percent, and the amount of one hundred billion dollars was uh, very quickly taken up. So in terms of popularity, why is this scheme less popular than the previous scheme? Chairman, it's not the case that this scheme is less popular than the last one. If we talk about the maximum uh, ceiling uh, or maximum amount of uh, $12 million, uh, the amount is the same. Chairman, I think you're referring to the special 
loan guarantee scheme uh, rolled out in 2008. Uh, back then, the interest rates were set by the lending institutions. The administration did not impose any uh, fixed interest rate. So throughout that scheme, from 2008 to the end of 2010, throughout the two-year period, 43,000 applications were processed with um, uh, the 39,000 cases approved. Now you only have uh, some 6,000 applications, right? We received over 7,000 applications in just seven months' time. Approved applications as stated in the paper, some 6,400 of them. So uh, we don't think that the popularity of this scheme is less than the previous scheme. Uh, our uh, data um, collected is only up to the end of March. It's just several months. Mr. Wong, you raise a very good point. I want the PS not to uh, quote dances from the paper. The reality is uh, that uh, although you say the interest rate is uh, set by the lending institution, but but the reality is that basically back then the interest rate would not exceed 4%. Why do you say that this scheme is as popular as the last one, but the number of applications are much uh, are much less. Now the reason is that last time the banks processed the applications directly. And Chairman, this time you and I both know that uh, the HKMC will vet the application before it's further submitted to banks for approval. Last time it's uh, a direct service, but now there are two hurdles to go through. So efficiency, in terms of efficiency, uh, it's not as good as uh, the scheme in 2008. Last time it was very efficient. Money arrived very soon. So I think the policy is good, but it's not perfect. There are flaws, there are difficulties, and we need to spill it out. We want to perfect the policy because we see this scheme in 2008, and uh, with this scheme, uh, comparisons are inevitable. This is my point. Yes, we understand that the HKMC has requested to check the applications before they are submitted to banks for approval. Well, this is uh, their practice under the SME financing guarantee scheme. But on the actual number of applications approved, I'd like to say that out of 7,000 applications, only 30 applications or so have not been approved. So the process might be taking longer, but in fact, only a small number of applications have been rejected. So in terms of percentage, this is less than 0.5 percent. So if you have the relevant information. Can you make a comparison? Last time it was 100 billion and um, is handled by banks directly, and now you have to go through Hong Kong MC. Now, for the previous exercise, that is the SME financing guarantee scheme, the total number of approval was 39,000. And nine hundred and six, and number of rejection was three hundred ninety-four. And for this scheme, 
approval. 6,407. A rejection, 38. So it's just half when it's compared to the previous scheme. Yes, now they have to go through another tier of vetting, but the number of rejection is not high. Actually, it's better than the previous scheme. Last time, the rejection rate was 1%. But for a company, last time the cost was lower or what? Because last time it was free. And this time, well, the government is providing a loan guarantee commitment of $100 billion. And for the Hong Kong MC, it charges an, a rate for the interest. Uh, it's subsidized by the government. So this rate has uh, been cut by 70%. Now, of course, the uh, companies would have to pay this fee. It's like a premium. But uh, when it's compared with the normal premium, it's just only one third. If you compare this with um, the SFGS in 2008, yes, they didn't charge anything. But if you are borrowing $5 million, then the premium is just several thousand dollars. So this is not a significant amount. In principle, we support the FS proposal that is lengthening this SFGS. Well, we think that um, the economic outlook uh, for the end of this year is still unclear, so we support the FS measure. Well, by lengthening this scheme, we do not need to go to the Finance Committee. But for the SME Exports Marketing Fund and the increase of the cumulative grant ceiling, we have to go to the FS, uh, FC. So if there are many more applicants in the future, uh, do you have enough resources? Now for 4,800, um, does they are companies that have reached um, the cumulative grant ceiling. So if we do not change the scheme, they cannot apply for any more funds. They have exhausted their $150,000. And for the SME Exports Marketing Fund, we have uh, approved uh, 158,000 cases. And among these cases, 4,000 companies have reached the cumulative grant ceiling. So when assessing our expenditure, if these 4,000 companies can have a higher ceiling, that is, um, then we will have to spend more. So that's why we have to apply to the FC. Well, originally the grants approved was 3.75 billion, and now we have only used 75% of that. So if the ceiling is raised, the approved budget can last us until the middle of 2015. So 3.75 billion is enough, right? Now it's divided into two parts. One is for the SME Exports Marketing Fund. The other is SME Development Support Fund. And they are both supported by this 3.75 billion. And now we have only used about 76% of that. So even though we adjust the ceiling upwards, we will still have enough money for operating the two funds until the middle of 2015. 
But of course, if the fund uh, depletes rapidly, we will come back to apply for more funding. Yes, we absolutely support that. So if there are more demands from the SMEs, please tell us earlier. Okay. I think uh, most of the members have left. So, uh, P.S., thank you for attending the meeting. We still have one agenda item under AOB. And only Mr. Liu Chuan Kong is here. This is an invitation from Tamasek Foundation Center for Trade and Negotiations. It's inviting um, national members to join a WTO workshop. I do not want to spend too much time on this. I think in the previous two years, uh, no LegCo members went to this meeting. So I believe members are not too interested in this event. So can we tell Tamasak that we are not interested? Mr. Liu, what do you think, Chairman? Because in the past two years, no member volunteer to go, and now almost all members are gone. So let us take it like that, right? No members is, is interested in going. Let's not waste time. So if there's no other business, we'll adjourn the meeting here. Thank you, Mr. Liu.